welcome to Health Alert. I'm Pam Butler. Today we're going to talk about a fascinating program called Second Chance. And joining me to talk about that program is Eddie Evans. He's the director of North Tulsa Programs and he works with Youth Services. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Now, I want you to tell people a little bit, before we start into the specific program that I want to highlight, tell us a little bit about Youth Services. Well, Youth Services of Tulsa is a full service pro, uh, agency. We do uh, just about every, provide services for just about every area that you can have a youth involved in. We have on the front end our street outreach program that goes out and works with homeless youth that we find uh, don't have stable environment to live in. Some are living on the street. Mm -hmm. On the back end, we have transitional living, which is apartment complexes that we own that we provide housing for these young people to get them off the streets. In between, we've got family counseling. We have uh, a youth shelter, emergency shelter, that's a 20-bed facility, which is the largest uh, emergency shelter in the, in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, the kids stay there 24 hours a day with staff on duty uh, 24 hours also. Uh, we have a health education program. Uh, youth services provides a first offender program, which is one of the courtroom environment that is run actually by their peers. Um, the judge, the prosecutors, everybody are teenagers and they're actually provide a verdict uh, that the young person has to go by unless they revert back to the Juvenile Bureau. Okay, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that program too, but before I ask you about that one, I want to sort of go back a little bit when you talk about the emergency services and transitional living, especially if there's not family members involved. Absolutely. How young um, does your clientele have to be in terms of the youth? How young and then how can they access you on their own or do they really still have to have some type of parental or legal guardianship kind of situation? We have uh, several avenues that, that a young person can come to us to access a shelter. We have what we call Safe Place. Safe Place is not a youth services program, it's a national program. But a child can go to a fire department, get on a city bus, go to a quick trip and tell the, the personnel there that they need a safe place, mm -hmm. that they don't have anywhere to go. Youth services, they will in turn call youth services. We will dispatch a volunteer to go out and bring them to our shelter. Uh, the thing about um, uh, that, that we take this so serious is that a fire department that has a kid present his or herself, they go offline. They don't answer calls until we get someone out there, pick them up, and bring them to the shelter. Wow. Now, is, is this a child of any age? Uh, what's the age of entry? Our age group in our shelter is 11 to 18. Wow. We try to work with the kids that are in that, 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 that scope. Now, we're not going to turn down a kid that, that, we, that needs to get there for services, but once we get them and, and they're under age, then it's up to us to get them to the appropriate agency. Okay, now some people may be wondering too, especially when you talk about as young as 11, saying that they need a safe place. What if this is just a child who's upset with their parents or, or just, you know, don't want to have the kind of discipline that they're giving, not that it's abusive at all, but just that they don't want to be disciplined or told you can't do this, you can't do that. And so they get on the bus and they get to the fire department or someplace such as this. How do you screen or what do you do to know that this is really legitimate and then do you have an obligation to contact the, the parent or legal guardian? Absolutely. What we do is, is we, we dispatch a a volunteer. The volunteer is just a person to bring them, bring that, that individual to the shelter. Once they're there, mm -hmm. then we make the assessment of what's okay. going on, and we definitely don't want a parent out there wondering if the kid's alive or dead or something going on with them. So we do, we're obligated to contact parents. Okay. Now, what if the parent were to say, I want them back home? Um, everything is fine and the child is telling you that things are not fine. I mean, they're really seriously concerned and maybe there is some abuse in terms of what they're telling you. And the parent says, I want them back. What happens? Well, we try to get a, 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 almost immediately get a family counselor involved okay. so that when the, the parent comes that we have an opportunity to visit with both parties, the child. 
Now, if the child is physically abused and we can see that, then it, we're obligated to report that abuse to the Department of Human Services. Okay, so uh, the child doesn't have to be concerned that you're not going to look into things properly and just send them back into no. the same dangerous situation. No. And by the same token, if the parent and things are okay, you're going to work with them to work that out as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, and if they need just a time out, if, if it's, things are so so crazy that they can't get together that night, we would suggest that the child stay until we get things calmed down. Ma, the, the parent knows where the child is, that the child is safe, and maybe we can get things calmed down to where we can work toward unification maybe at a later date. Okay. Let me ask you about this program where you say that the youth are the, the judge and the jury and that type of thing. Are these youth that are part of your program? Is it youth that you recruit from various school systems? Uh, how, how do people become a part of that? These young ladies and men are uh, recruited from various high schools. Okay. And they're brought in and trained um, by prosecutors, by judges, and by individuals involved in the court to be able to handle uh, a courtroom environment independently. These, these they're witnesses. It's, it's, a, it's a courtroom. Uh, really, it's a courtroom. It's very impressive, and I would uh, encourage anybody that uh, would be interested to come by and, and uh, uh, maybe visit and, and get to know the program better. It is one of the, the few opportunities to be actually judged by your peers. Now, with this, the person who um, is the offender, how are they getting there? Are these where they've been referred in because they're having difficulty or they've been in trouble or what? Well, the, usually it's the first time that they're getting involved with the court system. Usually a petty larceny or okay. something minor. And uh, they are referred to us by the Juvenile Bureau. They say, this is a kid that has just now we haven't seen him before. Mm -hmm. Let's refer him over to youth services to the youth court and, and have him go or her go through that process and see how it helps him. Okay, now the verdict or the outcome, the judgment, is it permanent it, in terms of what the youth court decides or do they have to go back into the court to get that certified or what? The verdict that, the, that, the, that our youth court renders is, is binding and that, that young person has to go by that, that verdict or they will revert back to the Juvenile Bureau and be judged by that court. Okay, and is this something too that the parent, if they're underage um, in terms of the youth, that they have to agree to? They're all referred, uh, the parent and the child come at the same time. Okay, and one last quick thing, what is the age range? These, these youngsters, they're running around, oh, they could go from, we try to stay in that. 11 to 18 range. Okay. That's what you're defined as a juvenile in the, in the, in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, well, what we're going to do is take a really quick break, Abby, and then we're going to come back and I want to ask you how youth are faring in general before we get into our second chance program. Okay, please stay with us. We'll be right back. Forty percent of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business. Welcome back to continue our discussion talking about the Second Chance program that's offered by Youth Services of Tulsa. Joining me again is Eddie Evans, the director of the North Tulsa programs. Let's jump in now. Before we get to Second Chance program, as I was mentioning, tell us a little bit about our youth. How are they faring in relation to issues related to juvenile behavior that's uh, not very good behavior, uh, incarceration, those kinds of things? Well, our youth are doing, I, I would say, according to the, the information that we look at. Mm -hmm. um, we do have quite a few youth that are getting involved in gang activities. We do have quite a few youth that's not faring well in school. But uh, overall, um, we see quite a few, we see a large number that are doing well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's what the youth services does, is try to find an edge and try to feel it. Okay, so would you say, because sometimes we see in the media and things, it, it makes it sound like, although we know there are plenty of youth that are doing well and operating like, you know, as, as members of our society that we would wish, 
we sometimes feel like this is growing among the youth that are having difficulty. Is it a, really a growing trend that more are doing worse or are having uh, involvement with violent or gang or criminal behavior or is it really kind of steady or slow growth really? Because we feel like it's exploding. Well, we do have a high number of youth that are getting involved in gang activity for the simple reason that it's so attractive to them. Okay. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of our children join gangs for protection. They join gangs because they live in infested areas and if they're not a member, then they're preyed upon a lot. But I don't believe, and, 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 and I'm, I'm, I work with troubled youth, so that's the population I'm with the most. Mm -hmm. But I see a high population of our youth doing well. Okay, so maybe we're just focusing, as we should, but maybe a little more on those who are not doing well, and so that kind of sort of colors that we feel like it's just out of control. Well, the media, the kids that are out of control uh, is the better story than a kid that's, that's doing well. Um, and, and to focus in on, on negative behavior uh, it seems to make a better story for the media than someone that's doing well. Okay. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a high population of youth doing well. Okay, do you find in, in working with the youth that you work with, since you work with troubled youth, and as you mentioned in the first segment, you have the youth, youth court, do you find that there's a lot of recidivism among youth that once again, once they start kind of doing better or they get out, they really go back to the same thing in short order, or do you find that overall they still progress and do well with the proper support systems and things such as that? We found that the dependency um, the, the sooner that we get involved, the better our results are. Okay. If we get a child that's 11 years old mm -hmm. and run them through, uh, get them into our youth court program, our family counseling programs, and surround them with the services that they need, we have found that we're more successful. But the older children that we get, we, we come in contact with them when they're 16, 17, almost 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have penetrated the system a little deeper, and it's harder, it, it's a much uh, more encompassing process to try to get them turned around. Now, do you find, in terms of the services you offer and kind of that support system, uh, especially with the younger youth, that it's something that if they come in at 11 or 12, that it's two or three years that you're needing to stay in touch with them or, or have programmatic involvement or things like that. Is it something that needs to be a continuous intervention or is it they get to a certain point then that's it and then they have another problem come back again? Some are okay once we provided services and, and, and got them at a stable um, position. Some do well. Some of the kids that, that we see now we've seen for five or six years. Okay. But the good thing is that they know where to come, they know what they need, and they know that there's someone out there that's willing to help them. And that, to me, is encouraging. If we see them on a consistent basis, we still have an opportunity to make a difference in their lives. Some can just get a short spurt, and they're gone, and they're okay. okay. But some need consistency. Some children just come and sit in the lobby and say, can I sit here for a minute? I'd like to see so-and-so and so-and-so. Mm -hmm. and, -so. and, and we try our best to spend time with them if they need that. And that's what's really critical, too, because by saying there's some that have been there five or six years, for kids that may need that, youth that need that, that's a comforting thing that it's not a, because sometimes programs, you come in, this is it, you got to go. Absolutely. But yours is there, and it's a, a long term if it needs to be tailor-made that way for that particular child and their family. Oh, yeah. So I wish the kids at some time, I, I picked up at uh, 16, at 30s now, they still come by. <laughs> but uh, okay. that means that we're making an we're having an effect. Exactly. We may not be as successful with them as we want to be, but at least they're still hanging in there and they're still coming by. That's excellent. Now, tell me a little bit about the Second Chance Program. The Second Chance Reentry Program is a program that is a federal grant that we um, at, that came to Oklahoma through the Office of Juvenile Affairs, passed through the Youth Services. Um, it is a program where we work with young men and women that have actually been incarcerated in secure facilities all over the state of Oklahoma. 
um, that are coming back to the Tulsa community once they're released. And we're providing them with intensive family counseling services. They work with the family to get the family prepared for them coming back. We provide case, ser case management services, on, which is under my program, which works with the youth, not only uh, when they come out, they mm -hmm. start working with them when they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, we start meeting, start talking, start coming up with a plan. Uh, try to get them connected to services that they're going to need, school, job, things that they're going to need when they get out of an institution to make them, uh, help them be successful when they return to the community. Now that's really interesting you say you start with them while they're still in the institution because yeah. being institutionalized is a powerful uh, factor too because there's certain kinds of, of norms and value systems and things that you learn in order to survive in an institution. So how intense or direct is what you do while they're in that environment? I mean, do you start talking about their experiences in that environment and what's going on and how to translate that into when they come out, what should be different or how, you know, the environment they're thinking about is the same as where they're coming from? Uh, how, how, how intense is it? It's pretty intense. We, we come up with a treatment plan that the child and the case manager hammers out between the two of them. Uh, we try to let them, the individual, the youth, um, provide the bullet points for that, for that uh, treatment plan. These are the things that I'm going to need when I get out of here to be successful. Uh, one of the toughest things for us to do is when a child leaves a, a, a secure facility and has to go right back to the environment mm -hmm. that he or she came from, it doesn't take friends and the negative uh, peers to uh, uh, an hour or two to know you're back home. Mm -hmm. So we we have to provide services that will surround them with the necessary tools to be able to survive within an environment that has an op that, that that has the capability of consuming them the minute they get back home. Okay. So it's very intense. I mean, when you look at services, we're looking at a case manager seeing them twice or three times a week, uh, spending time with them, okay. talking with them on the phone, being available to them 24 hours a day. If a kid's in trouble at midnight, give me a call. Uh, we're going to try to do everything we can to keep them safe, keep them stable, keep them healthy, and keep them in, in, in moving down the right road. Okay. Well, when we come back, Eddie, I want to pick up on some of those points, too, in terms of in that environment when they return and also the family. Okay? Absolutely. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Up to 40% of businesses never recover after experiencing a major disaster. Make a plan at ready.gov slash business. Welcome back to complete our discussion looking at the Second Chance program. Joining me again is Eddie Evans, the director of North Tulsa Programs. He's with Youth Services of Tulsa. Let's jump in, Eddie. You were talking about the Second Generation program, especially uh, generation, Second Chance yeah. program, uh, especially when youth are coming back into um, their own setting. How do you, okay, you start to work with the youth while they're still incarcerated yeah. um, to make sure that they're understanding the things that they're going to need and you ask them their concerns so that you make sure that they have ownership of it. Right. How do you begin to work with the family structure while the youth is still incarcerated to help them prepare for that particular um, child's reentry? We have a, a program that is, uh, is entitled Intensely, Intensive family services. These, act, these individuals actually three months or uh, four months, whatever is necessary, prior to the young lady or young man um, um, exiting an institution, they are assigned to the family. Mm -hmm. They actually go out to the home, they work with the, the family, they do family counseling if needed. We make sure that if they need uh, community-based services, that they get them, that they have um, opportunities to provide the child what he or she will need uh, when they get out. The family knows their shortcomings, maybe don't have one bedroom. We try to find them a place to, to where they can get another bedroom. If they need furniture, if they need clothing, if they need 
um, financial stability. We try to work with that. On top of that, we work with the stabilizing the family mentally for the simple reason some of these kids have raised mm -hmm. so much havoc in these homes exactly. that most parents say, I just don't want them back. Mm -hmm. But that's not an option with someone, a child that's under age. So we have to figure out a way to get them back together that they survive and that they know that, that we're going to provide services not only to the youth but to the family so we make ourselves available to them. Uh, this is an intense, these, these people are uh, uh, licensed therapists to work with families okay. that are in that type of situation. Okay, now with the families too, because like you said, many times there can be a fear factor with that individual coming back depending on what kind of havoc they were involved in before they left. But yet this is still a, a child because they're, you know, they're still minors who may need discipline with your counseling structure in terms of the physical things they may need. Um, do you work a lot with the family members, especially the parents or guardians, to understand the kind of structure and discipline that you still have to have that's a positive focused one for this youth, instead oh, yes. of just saying, okay, just, just go, or leave me alone, or you know, those kinds of things? Oh, yes. You, you have to keep in mind that these children didn't get to the point where they are by themselves. The family has to take some type of stake in that. Um, we are dealing with a lot of parents that are young mothers mm -hmm. okay. and young fathers that don't have a lot of parenting skills themselves. So we have to teach that to them. Um, parenting classes, sometimes they're, they're okay, but sometimes you have to go a little farther. And, and with our services, we sort of take them by hand and, and lead them through the process. These children, when they come out of these institutions, they are also under the supervision of the Office of Juvenile Affairs. Okay. The Office of Juvenile Affairs for a juvenile, that's the last step. You cannot get any deeper in the juvenile justice system than the Office of Juvenile Affairs. You move any further, you're over in the Department of Correction. And so that's the adults. That's component. the adults. Okay. So most of these kids are, are pretty deep in the juvenile system, and they're under probation when they come out. And they're under supervised, a lot of them are supervised probation. A lot of them wearing ankle monitors and, and, and uh, detection devices so we can monitor their movement. Okay. So not only do we have that part of it, we provide the services to the child, we provide the services to uh, the youth, and we're coming together with the Office of Juvenile Affairs once a week, staffing these kids and these families and trying to come up and fill gaps that we, we identify that are needed. Well, let me ask this question, especially when you have um, youth that are coming out that are still school age. How or do you work with the schools that they're coming back into, or is that where you really don't bother the schools, it just stays with the youth and the family? Oh, no. Oh, no. If, if they need to be enrolled in school, we try to help with that process. We try to make sure that we know where they are academically when they, when they exit a facility. Uh, the kid may uh, benefit better from continuation school in a smaller classroom environment, maybe credit recovery uh, in, in place of going to school all day. Okay. Uh, so we, we, we need to know that too. The education piece, huge with these kids. GEDs, a lot of them have when they come out, but a lot don't, and, and, and they have to go back to school. But we have to partner ourselves with the school to work with these kids because a lot of these kids have raised havoc in these schools mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the schools don't want them <laughs> back, but, but they have to go. So we have to find the best environment, the best fit for the family, the child, and the school. So we're trying to work with everybody. Okay, now how long does the, the youth stay in the Second Chance program? The Second Chance program is a six month program mm -hmm. that we, when we get them out of there, we can keep them six months provide services for six months. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to say, okay, your six months is over and we're just going to drop you off the end of the world. We're not going to do that. If the kid needs us, we're there. Mm -hmm. We're going to provide services to them. We're not going to let them down. Right now, we've got, we've got 45 boys uh, playing basketball out at Chamberlain Park that just show up. You show up, we play. And, and we're keeping them off the streets by just working with them. All of them are not in the second chance program, but they all are teenage boys that need somewhere to go that's not on the streets, 
that are doing something productive. Well, let me ask this because you're talking about youth services here of Tulsa and how uh, people and, and youth that live in the Tulsa area. Are there similar services in other areas within Oklahoma that like youth services or can other areas rule or what if, if they can get into you, can they use the services? I mean, how does that work? Youth services is a, is a state agency, actually a line item in the state budget. Okay. Um, we operate under um, um, youth services, Oklahoma youth services agencies. There's one in each county. We have 77 youth service agencies. In Oklahoma City and Tulsa has, has pretty good size agencies because we're the largest entity. Mm -hmm. We have shelters, um, we have a uh, community intervention center. I don't know whether a lot of people know a lot about that, but the community intervention center is a place like if a police officer picks up a minor mm -hmm. in the middle of the night, can't find a parent, that officer's not stuck with that child. They take them to the community intervention center, child is safe, officer's back on the streets in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and, and we contact the parent and get them in. Okay. And if services are needed, we, well, there's an assessment made, and if services are needed, then they're referred to other uh, programs in our agency so they can get services that they need. Okay, so there are sister services, like you said, through Youth Services of Oklahoma and other areas yes. that are like yours that people can access yes. as well. So they need, if they don't know about it, they need to find out about it right. and be aware of it and start to access those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. One last question. For these youth in the second generation, uh, second chance, I want to call it second generation because <laughs> it's almost so like easy. they're having a second start. <laughs> uh, but in the second chance program, once their services are done there, like so you don't drop them, they too move into your other services that we talked about earlier based upon their need. Oh, sure. A lot of the kids that, that, that don't have places to stay uh, we try to place them in our transitional living program okay. so we can keep them and provide services until they're stable. Okay. They can stay there from until 9 to 12 uh, months. Okay. And then we try to help them transition into independent living, okay. which is, which is uh, an opportunity to get them stable. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that's our show for Health Alert. I'm Pam Butler. I'd love to hear your questions, suggestions for future shows. Please write me at Health Alert USA, P.O. Box 50913, Tulsa, Oklahoma 74150. Or if you're on the email trail, please email me at healthalertusa at gmail.com. And also visit me on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash healthalertusa. Look into the services in your community. Make sure that your youth and you get what you need and so we can have a healthier second or next generation. Take care.